tonight I want you to reimagine your connection with the earth via ants. The superbly sculptured, the incredibly adapted, an incredibly diverse group of insects that probably up until now you've wanted to kill, but you'll soon wish you knew more about. So please bring to mind, if you can, your most vivid memory of ants, an interaction or an observation of behaviour. I can hear the cogs turning and I'm not psychic, but I'm actually guessing that you're thinking of something fairly negative, a negative experience, ants coming into your homes, into your pantry. I can see people nodding in the honey, in the sugar, the biscuit tin. Are you imagining a sting or a bite from an Australian bull ant on a blissful camping trip in the Australian outback? Or are you envisaging little black ants scaling your hill's hoist, moving en masse their tiny eggs, larvae, pupae, and their sisters to a new nest, a more secure home, perhaps. And then when you saw that, did you look up? And did you half expect to see rain clouds? Did you use your observation of that ant behaviour to indicate something about the weather? I think some of you did. Well, ants are everywhere. They've been described as the premier soil turners, the channelers of energy, and the dominatrixes of the insect fauna. They're some of the most abundant and conspicuous insects in Australia. And we all have an ant story. When I started the Australian Node of the Citizen Science Project School of Ants two and a half years ago, I never expected the storytelling excitement that ants triggered. But I now know that everybody does have an ant story. And these stories are really important. They're important in understanding our perception of that small world. And they're a really wonderful segue into connecting to the tiny and complex ecosystems that are beneath our feet every day, both literally and figuratively. They help us understand our place in that ecosystem, how to take responsibility for it, and actually for mere wonder and curiosity. There are 13,000 species of ants in the world. And actually, given our propensity for finding patterns in nature and being a little bit superstitious, we've woven a pretty watertight story about how ants can predict the rain, predict the weather. But actually, you might be surprised to know that there is very little research and actually hardly any empirical evidence that explains directly the mechanisms by which ants change their behaviour seemingly suddenly in response to the weather. But ants are poikilothermic invertebrates which means they're cold-blooded and they have no backbone. That can be a new term for the night. Which, and they respond directly to their surrounding environment. So they breathe and they're directly connected to the outside world through tiny spiracles or holes in their exoskeleton. And they can't thermoregulate at all like we do. So in order to stay dry or to keep within their temperature envelope, well, they have to move to a more suitable location. And so would you. And research confirms, actually, that it is the weather that brings ants inside our homes and it's the weather that brings them out again. They escape excessive wetness, heat and drought. And I hate to tell you, but herbal, chemical or otherwise, there is no intervention that can stop that movement, even though you think it's true. <laughs> the 13,000 species of ants in the world is just the tip of the iceberg. They're only the ones we've named. We think there's probably that many again to discover, let alone give a name to. And in Australia, the recent molecular research has actually indicated there's more like 9,000 species of ants, not the 1,500 that we already know and have named. But it's only a tiny subset of those ant species that build up in numbers to dominate ecosystems, both in urban and native areas, to become pests, etching their way into our subconscious and into your ant stories. And I would argue that it's invasive ants, pest ants, that really showcase the impressive collective intelligence and ability to dominate these ecosystems. And that's where my own ant story comes in. So I found myself on a tropical island in the rainforest on Christmas Island in the year 2000 to do a PhD. And along with my supervisors and my colleagues, we set about investigating why the invasive yellow crazy ant, Anaplolepis gracilipes, 
built up in numbers, exploded in numbers, and killed hundreds and thousands of the endemic red land crab there. The land crab is the one that migrates to the ocean um, and back uh, in a biological spectacle that David Attenborough loves as well. <laughs> yeah. And when I got to that island, what I found there and what I saw, it changed my life. It changed my perception and understanding of these little things that run the world. We're on an island here. And all around us is not Barangaroo Tower, but it's a rainforest. It's beautiful and a complex rainforest. And typically in a rainforest, there's visible ants, one or two. And if you look a bit harder, there's many more. But in our rainforest here, on every surface in three-dimensional space is a moving carpet of yellow ants. That's pretty much what it was like on Christmas Island. Not one or two ants over here, not one trail going up the tree, but a carpet, and it was moving. And in fact, this video that I've got here shows a carpet of yellow crazy ants. These, these are actually piles of yellow crazy ants. And this is taken by Frank Tioto, a resident in Cairns in North Queensland. And these are about a sort of a 50 to 100 ant thick carpet or pile of ants. That's, yeah, a gape. It's, that's on the edge of a stream and it's a small pile. Imagine that spread out moving over an entire rainforest. It's quite incredible. In the multiple super colonies on Christmas Island that in 2002 totaled over 2,500 hectares, there were no holes in those carpets. I lived and worked in these carpets and ants for almost three years and I had to modify the way I dressed to stop getting formic acid burns on my legs from crazy ants building up between my socks and my boots. I had to modify all my ant sampling techniques the traditional ones were, just didn't work. There were just too many ants. And I actually um, had to become zen, like you wouldn't imagine. Ants crawling all over me all the time. It bodes well for being a parent. <laughs> and in fact, going to the toilet for number twos in the middle of an 800 hectare yellow crazy ant super colony is pretty traumatic and not something I'll describe here, but you can use your imagination. <laughs> But the success of these ants was actually to be found in the trees. They form a mutualism with sap-sucking insects, scale insects. And the scale insects are on the trees. They ingest phloem from canopy rainforest trees and they excrete carbohydrate-rich honeydew. And the ants eat the honeydew. And in eating the honeydew and running all over the scale insects in the trees, they they protect the scale insects, they defend them, they keep the natural enemies away. And so it's a positive feedback system. The more ants, the more scales, the more ants, the more scales, the more ants, the more scales, and so on, you get the picture. Both partners benefit, and when the populations reach a critical threshold, the impacts are amplified on the forest, and it creates what we call invasional meltdown. And insect, in fact, invasion, invasive ants all over the world have harnessed these mutualistic systems to build up their numbers and dominate landscapes. And then they outcompete native ants. They uh, change, they, they, they disrupt ecosystem services. They change whole landscapes. And on Christmas Island, in our case, they killed land crabs that were over 500 times their own biomass. So the crisis was then that in killing the red land crabs, they were removing a keystone species. They actually changed the entire structure and composition of the rainforest there. The red crab is the keystone species or the gardener there that eats seeds and seedlings and leaf litter and creates a very open canopy, an open canopy, and, uh, sorry, an open understory. So it's very clear and unique to Christmas Island, in fact. But in removing the red crabs and the keystone species, well, they changed the landscape completely. The ants modified it. The seeds grew into seedlings and clogged the understory of the rainforest. The leaf litter built up, and it actually created habitat for unwanted customers, including introduced giant African land snails, which actually became a problem in themselves. But how did these ants do it? A tiny insect modifying entire landscapes. Well, my work was testing the idea that, yes, it was the weather that linked to the explosion in numbers of yellow crazy ants. And the idea goes something like this. Plants, when they're stressed, they mobilise nitrogen and elements uh, in their phloem that sap-sucking insects can access a little bit more readily. These, these amino acids and nitrogen are otherwise bound up in defence systems when they're not stressed. 
This readily available nitrogen grows the scale insect populations and we thought that there was the bottom rung of that fit positive feedback loop. And there was an El Nino system, in fact, over the Indian Ocean um, at the time where yellow crazy ants built up their density. So the forest there was incredibly dry and water stressed. But for me, counting ants, conducting experiments in the rainforest and monitoring the water dynamics on the island for all this time, well, it, it came down to this. It wasn't the weather that kicked it off at that certain time. It was actually the ants themselves and that mutualistic interaction, the biotic interaction between the two partners that caused incremental population increases to the point where it exploded. It was the connection between those two organisms and the trees that they were on that were responsible for the explosion in invasive ant numbers, for those carpets and for invasional meltdown. Now, knowing this helped us control them and I worked with national parks and academic colleagues and many organisations to create a model for conservation that was really grounded in research and understanding the ants themselves. I wouldn't wish for carpets of moving yellow crazy ants beneath anyone's feet. I really wouldn't. But tonight, I want you to think about your feet and what they connect you to every day. They connect you to the earth, literally. Think about what you walk on. Concrete, grass, pavers, your backyard, bare dirt, leaf litter. Well, there's ants in there. There's hundreds of them, possibly thousands. And in fact, it's thought that there's over 100 trillion individual ants on the Earth at any one time. Together, they weigh more than all the invertebrates put together, save humans. And the ants are in there with flies, with cockroaches, with grasshoppers, bugs, beetles, isopods, springtails, so many other invertebrates. They're in there and they're running the world from the ground up. We're stepping on them every day. Our physical relationship with ants and those little things that run the world, well, it's fraught. As a parent, you might know, we want to keep those nasties away from our vulnerable children. Mosquitoes, through carrying infectious diseases, well, they kill far more people than buses and sharks and drugs combined. Bull ants will sting you, wasps will sting you, bees will sting you. We rarely stop and just watch them or elaborate on our own ant stories. So tonight I'd like to challenge you to think about your perception of ants' place in the functioning of things. And next time you see an ant on your boot or on your hilt hoist, on the pavement or in your pantry, I want you to stop and take a closer look at her. She can help you connect to the earth, your earth, our earth, and help you appreciate the little things that are running the world. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kirsty Abbott. Um, before I let you go, Kirsty, you like to eat, obviously. Yes. Do you eat ants? Yes. Yeah. What do they taste like? A little bit acidic. Green tree ants, lemony, acidic. Yeah. Australian Aboriginals used to make lemonade yeah, with right. the abdomens of green tree ants. And what about yellow crazy ants? I know you don't like them on your ankles or when you're doing it <coughs> yeah. uh, in the forest. What it, yeah, do you, yeah. Have you eaten them? No. No. Well, accidentally, <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, I know there's only been some chips and nuts here tonight, but Kirsty does have some ants if you'd like to eat them. We're, let's pull them out. A bit small here. Um, I'm not going to try it right now because the acidic bit makes me a bit squirmish, but uh, if you're feeling a bit peckish, <laughs> a couple of snacks here for you. Uh, thank you very much. Kirsty Abbott once again, you're ladies welcome. and gentlemen. Thank you.